going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Luke chapter 5. The Gospel of Luke chapter 5 is our text. And is, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device and you are in the room, then uh, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1023 and you will be able to follow along and find Luke chapter 5 and uh, join us in the study of this text. We're, we're doing a study called The Son of God, uh, and it's a year-long study in the Gospel of Luke. We were just going to spend time with the Son of God, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, and learn about Him. Uh, and as always, if you uh, are here and you want a Bible and you don't have one, take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Uh, and if you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then just message us and we will get a Bible to you, whether we mail that to you or deliver that to you. We want you to have the Word of God as well. Hey, uh, I know some of you are a little bit perplexed because you're going, hey, I thought Pastor Chad was a Cardinals fan and why in the world is he wearing a Bengals shirt? Is he like jumping on the Bengals bandwagon? What, what is up with this? Is he a turncoat, a traitor? Uh, and, and I just want you guys to know something that you probably don't know about me. I was born uh, in Kentucky and uh, so I, I grew up kind of in the, the South, Midwest, uh, back in the dark ages before there was a team, uh, professional team every so often. And I grew up a Bengals fan. Uh, and, uh, and I was a hardcore Bengals fan. I guess you could say I have a long history of rooting for losers. Uh, so uh, I'm consistent in that. And when uh, they, I was rooting for a Bengals Cardinals Super Bowl, I was like, come on. Uh, but we know about the Cardinals. And um, so I said, if the Bengals make it, I'm going to wear I couldn't get a jersey. So this is what, this is what I got. So uh, I'm rooting. But I'm, no, I'm not. I, I just, this, that's my prehistory with that. I, I started becoming a Cardinals fan after I moved here and, and never saw the Bengals on TV again. Uh, back in the days before NFL Sunday ticket. And it doesn't matter because I work on Sundays anyway. Hey, speaking of... Uh, Speaking of places that we are from, hey, we have mentioned a couple of times uh, uh, that we want to, uh, and this is, uh, guys, that you, those are in the room. This applies to you if you're like a, a snowbird, uh, but this is especially for our online guests. We've got about 1,400 online participants a week that are, are part of the Calvary family, and a lot of, the, yeah, that's kind of exciting, isn't it? And, and a lot of those are, are you guys when you're traveling or, and have a suit people, Parker people when they're on the road. But a lot of them are people who've tuned in from all over the place. And we made an offer and no one has yet uh, taken us up on that except for one. And that is this. We would love to come and visit you in, in your online campus. What we're saying is where you're watching us from. We would love to come and visit you and, and celebrate a, a weekend service or even just a, a service online. Uh, at your home, with your family, with your friends, uh, in your neighborhood. And, and we'd love to do that kind of this summer. And so if you are joining us online and you'd love to host us for uh, a, an afternoon or an evening where we can uh, talk about what God is doing in your life and, and hear how we can help you, bless you. If there's somebody who wants to get baptized, we'd love to do that. Uh, we'll make a short video and we'll share it back here with the home campuses. But uh, we would love to do that. If you're in the room and you live someplace else and you join us online for half the year and you're here half the year, uh, let us know before you go home because we'd love to schedule some of these. Uh, we've actually got one scheduled. We don't have dates yet. But we're gonna be in Seldovia, Alaska sometime uh, this summer. So uh, we're, uh, we were supposed to be there last year, but uh, COVID wiped that out. So uh, we're, we're gonna make that visit. We're gonna make that, that uh, journey. So. Uh, just let us know, because we value everyone who's part of the Calvary family, whether you are in our local communities of Havasu and Parker or whether you are far, far away. We will come and see you, but you got to let us know you want us to come. And, uh, and if you let us know you want us to come, we want to be in touch and plan that out and make sure the dates work and all that kind of stuff. And when I say us, I mean one of the pastors here at Calvary, uh, we want to do that. And, and speaking of, uh, you know, really cool things that we get to do, uh, Last night was an amazing event. Uh, you got to see a little bit of the video, the Evening of Hope. I, I just want to echo what Sean shared. You know, we had well over 100 participants, uh, well over 300 volunteers, a whole a room full of parents uh, of these, uh, these wonderful participants, and just a delightful time. So thank you for being uh, a church that likes to play outside the rules a little bit and, and have a great time and celebrate 
with people that a lot of the world overlooks. So if you served, thank you. If you supported, thank you. If you donated, thank you. Uh, it is just a joy to lead a church like Calvary. Now, I say that, we had a party last night here. This place was rocking. So how many of you like to party? See, a lot of you raised your hand and some of you are like, is that a trick question? Because we're in church and I'm not sure if the pastor is like asking me to confess so I have to repent or what? Uh, is he gonna rebuke me? So let me change the question. How many of you like to attend parties? All the, <laughs> See, all, you just, all the extroverts just identified themselves. All the introverts are like, I don't know, who's gonna be there and what are we having? <laughs> right? Introverts, am I right? You guys are like, I need more details uh, before I commit. So let me try this again. Um, who enjoys a, a wedding, birthday, retirement, or anniversary celebration for close friends or family that you actually like? Okay, now the hands are all going up. Now see that, I clarified that. So would you want to go to a party with Jesus? Or would that be awkward? No. Now I want you to think about that, see? So I, I hope you are comfortable with the idea of celebrating because the kingdom of God is a party. And, and the kingdom of God is a party, especially with death, disreputable people. That's right. Read on. Luke chapter five, picking up verse 27. Uh, it says, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, Levi rose and followed Jesus. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at, at Jesus' disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, if you read the gospels at all, Jesus was often at parties or celebrations or dinners and feasts. Like for instance, if you read the gospel of John, the very first miracle that it, Jesus is recorded doing was at, do you guys know where he was at? He was at a a wedding, he was at a wedding and Jesus turned water into wine and allowed the celebration to continue. Uh, by the way, growing up Southern Baptist, they never taught that miracle uh, <laughs> at all. Uh, and by the way, a lot of the, the uh, reports of Jesus being at parties were with disreputable people. They were not appropriate people. In the Old Testament, God actually commands his people to feast and remember. There are major feasts throughout the calendar year that the, the Israelites would observe to remember the acts of God. Like for instance, the biggest one is the Passover celebration. It's a week-long party or series of parties. And in that, they are remembering that God delivered them from slavery in Egypt as a nation. So, uh, you know, the Old Testament is full of feasting and celebrating. And, and then of course, the ending event of this world as we know it is a party. It's the wedding supper of the lamb. And uh, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're invited. So the kingdom of God is a party. And the good news is this, you are invited. Some of you are like, really? Am I, am I? Yeah, we're, we're gonna talk more about that. But the kingdom of God is a party. And, uh, and I know some of you that grew up in church, like I did, may not be comfortable with that whole party word. And, and in your heart, you're, maybe you're saying, can we call it a fellowship? No, it's a party. The kingdom of God is a party with disreputable people. So we're gonna examine this story closer and maybe this opening point will make more sense as we go. See, first we see that Jesus called an outcast to be an apostle. Jesus called an outcast to be an apostle. He called this guy named Levi to follow him. Now you may not know who Levi is. Levi is one of the 12 and uh, he's uh, known by another name in other gospels. He's called Matthew in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark and in John. So Matthew, uh, and, and by the way, uh, if you read the Bible at all, you realize people have multiple names lots of times. Like Saul is known as Paul because one name is Hebrew and one name is Greek. And the same is true with Levi and Matthew. Levi is obviously his Hebrew name and Matthew was his Greek name. But he's the same guy when you read the uh, accounts and you read the Gospels. 
So, but he's the same person. So Jesus called Levi to follow him. And understand, Levi was a tax collector. Tax collectors were seen in the first century as traitors. Traitors to their country, to their countrymen. Because they collaborated with the Romans. They basically worked for the Romans, doing the Romans' dirty work. The Romans were occupying Israel at the time. Uh, they were the oppressors, and the, the, the Jewish people were the oppressed. And so anyone who was a tax collector was basically selling their soul to make money at working for the Romans. And, and not only did they work for the Romans but, the Romans, but they had the authority to extort money from their countrymen. So they would, uh, you know, sell out their countrymen and they would make profit over that. So they were seen as the most evil people that you could hang out with. They were the outcasts of society. And when I say outcasts, they were officially the outcasts. If you read the Gospels, and we read in this account, the Pharisees and their scribes, in other words, the religious leaders, were, were opposed to Jesus and his disciples, representing religious people, being even with them in their presence, in their home. This is wrong. Why would you hang out with tax collectors and sinners? So uh, good religious people didn't associate with tax collectors. And yet Jesus invited Levi to follow him. Follow me. No different than the invitation he gave to Peter and Andrew and James and John and the other disciples. Follow me. Jesus chose Levi to be one of the 12, one of the apostles. You know, because there was a whole bunch of people following Jesus and, and he chose the 12 to be his, uh, you know, disciples. But he sent 70 others out, you know, to preach and teach and heal. Uh, there weren't just 12 people. There was a whole crowd of people. And out of those... This tax collector, Levi, was one of the 12, an outcast brought into the inner circle of Jesus. And then imagine this, God used an outcast tax collector turned follower of Jesus to write one of the four gospels, the first book in your New Testament, the gospel of Matthew. I think that's really cool, but I want you to hear this. If you think you aren't good enough to follow Jesus, if you believe your past sins disqualify you from salvation, if you think Jesus doesn't want you because of where you've been or what you've done or how you have failed, you are absolutely wrong. You are absolutely wrong. God loves you. Jesus died for you to pay for your sins. Jesus invites you to follow him. Just like you did with Matthew, just like you did with Levi, follow me. And Jesus can use a disreputable, broken failure of a person in amazing ways for his kingdom. So Jesus called an outcast to be his disciple and to become an apostle. And, and can I just tell you something? Jesus is calling you right now. Jesus is calling you right now. He is saying, follow me. Now, some of you have never committed to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord, and, and you're the ones that first and foremost need to hear this because Jesus is calling you to surrender your life, to confess him as Lord, and to begin following Jesus intentionally because he loves you, because he died on the cross for your sins, because he was raised from the dead, and because he wants to give you eternal life, but you have to decide to follow him. You have to decide that you're gonna give up that resistance and you're gonna say, yes, Jesus, uh, I am yours and you are mine and I'm gonna follow you the rest of my life. Now, if you're sitting here, if you're watching this and, and you have not made that commitment to follow Jesus, we want you to make that commitment. We want you to simply just stop what you're doing and pray, Jesus, I need you, please save me, forgive me of my sins, I'm yours. Okay, that, that's, that's where this all begins, you surrendering to Jesus because he will change your life if you do that. And we want you to say yes to Jesus because a life-changing relationship with Jesus results in contagious celebration. A life-changing relationship with Jesus results in contagious celebration. Levi got up from his tax collecting booth and he followed Jesus. And he experienced the uncomfortable, life-changing grace of God. He knew he was loved. He knew he was forgiven. He knew he was included. And so what did he do? He threw a party. I love that. Don't you love that? I mean, he threw a party. And, and, he, and he threw a party uh, to celebrate life change. He threw a party for Jesus. And he threw a party and invited all of his other disreputable friends to come. 
Isn't that cool? I mean, he's like, hey, you guys, come on. You got to beat this guy. He changed my life. It was awesome. It was wonderful. Uh, see, contagious celebration is one of the core values here at Calvary. We believe following Jesus results in a joy-filled life which draws people to Jesus. Let me say that again. We believe that, that uh, following Jesus results in a joy-filled life which draws other people to Jesus. That, that's how it's supposed to work. So you meet Jesus. Jesus changes your life. You realize you are loved. You are forgiven. You have, you know, your life has been changed. Your destiny has been altered. And now you're filled with joy. And because your life is different and because you're living with joy, there are people who see you and think you're nuts, but they want what you have. And so they, they you know, follow you to follow Jesus. And, and we share that knowing that, that life can be difficult, painful, and tedious. We believe that knowing that we grieve losses and betrayals and failures. And we, we believe that knowing that we face adversity and anxiety and depression and fear. But see, we also know that when we experience life change because of Jesus' love and mercy, our life can't stay the same. It can't stay the same. Now understand, when you surrender to Jesus, he does not immediately fix your problems, restore your relationships, heal your bodies, or lift your depression. Okay, he's not just gonna fix stuff, but he'll be with you in stuff. In fact, he promises that he will never leave you or forsake you. He promises that nothing will separate us from his love. And, and here's the thing, if Jesus Christ changed your life, then you know that your destiny is forever altered. And it's altered from the, the pain and suffering and sorrow of hell to eternal life and joy and celebration and salvation in Jesus Christ. In other words, we know that, that we were destined for hell because of our rebellion and now because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we get to spend eternity in heaven. That is our reality, which brings joy into our life. Now see, knowing this, knowing these truths, it ought to bring a smile to your heart. Does it bring a smile to your heart? Yeah. Would some of you tell your face? <laughs> I'm just, I, come here, we, 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 we gotta do this. If it's here, it ought to show up here. You know, Jesus said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And, and if you really have the joy of Christ in your life, would you stop grimacing and frowning at everybody? <laughs> well, I don't like that. Well, get over it. You see, I cannot understand how we, followers of Jesus Christ, of all people, cannot celebrate in this broken, messed up world. All right, look, I, I know. I know how ugly, brutal, and evil this world is. I, I see the power politics. I hear the slander, the lies. I see the abuse of power. But here's what I know. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are loved. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you were included in his family, you were accepted in, as a servant of God, as a child of God. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are forgiven, you are gifted by the Holy Spirit, you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, you are owned by the Holy Spirit, and you are sent to represent Jesus to this world. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, guess what? You are on the winning team. Look, I'm rooting for the Bengals to win tomorrow, but I know that Jesus has already won the victory, okay? That, that's, that's the reality. So, and in all of that, it just, the, 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 the cherry on top is that heaven is our home forever. And nothing can change that if you belong to Jesus. Now, if you've got all of that information stuffed down into you, then this is our source of joy, even when we're confronted by pain. This is our reason for hope, even in the midst of loss. This is why we can have peace in the midst of, of any storm. And this is why we can love people even in the face of anger and outrage. You see, and, and if we respond with joy and contagious celebration, if, let me just say this, if joy and contagious celebration mark your life, it will draw people to Jesus. You, you'll hear people say things like, well, I, I, I didn't think church was like that. Uh, you know, I don't understand why you guys are happy all the time. The world's going, you know, it's falling apart. And, and why, why, you know, why, why do you act that way? Why do you think that way? Why, do you, can, why can you smile on this? How can you still be okay? How can you keep your sanity? See, it will draw people 
to Christ. So I want Calvary to be a place of celebration, of hope, of laughter. And, and by the way, it was just that last night. It was just like that last night, even when they were playing some really crazy secular music. Uh, <laughs> I'm just walking through with a smile on my face, thinking of all the people who would hate that. Uh, and then I repented. But anyway. You see, and, and I want Calvary to be a place like that. I want Calvary to be that place of joy and life change and, and celebrating that. Because I know that religious people don't like parties, and they really don't like those kind of people. Okay? Religious people don't like parties, and they don't like those kind of people. Um, Look, I don't know about your background, but I grew up with religious people. Like, again, I, I shared that I'm from Kentucky. I was, uh, I've been Southern Baptist since nine months before I was born. <laughs> okay? I mean, I was raised in church. We never asked, are we going to church? Uh, that was just a given. So, uh, you know, it, it was just part of life. And, uh, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and any special event that we had, and I grew up with religious people in, in well-intentioned, biblically-based churches, and, and they gave me a foundation of faith. But honestly, joy was almost always missing. And when I usually had fun in church, I usually got in trouble for it. <laughs> okay, that, we were doing something we weren't supposed to be doing. Uh, and, and here's the thing, church people, religious people, they say they have joy. I mean, they'll tell you, they'll protest it. I, we, oh, no, we're full of joy. They're full of something, but not, it's not usually joy. Because <laughs> they hide it so well. If, if it's joy, then, you know, they're not telling their face. They're not acting like it. Uh, look, I grew up in church, and I've heard church-appropriate humor. Uh, doesn't happen very often, and honestly, it's not funny. Look, I, I, I will confess, I enjoy humor. I enjoy all kinds of humor, even inappropriate humor, and I repent accordingly. But, um, but here's the thing, you know, church-appropriate humor isn't funny. Um, there was a time I was a youth pastor in seminary. I went back to Kentucky for seminary, and we went to our state youth camp, and I took my youth group, and, you know, uh, we had a good time at camp. But... Uh, at, at the end of the camp on the talent show night, uh, our youth group did a funny skit. And it, look, it wasn't lewd and it wasn't raunchy and it was, it was, just, it was just funny. It was to a Christian song acted out and, and, uh, and everything. And there were people who told the camp, they, I mean, the camp actually talked about barring us from coming back <laughs> because of these humor challenged adults that just didn't approve of us having fun. And, and by the way, it was the most popular thing that happened at talent show <laughs> because the other 14 acts were uh, little girls singing El Shaddai. So, uh, <laughs> see, and religious people don't even like the word party. They're not comfortable with their party. Religious language for party is fellowship. We're gonna have a fellowship. If you didn't grow up in church and you don't know this fellowship word, it's okay. You don't need to learn it. I'm just gonna tell you what happened. So in churches, where, you know, you go, we're gonna have a Sunday night fellowship, which just meant we're gonna have a party after the service, but we didn't call it parties because that's a heathen word. And, and, but a fellowship is where you eat food and maybe play games and you have fun with people that you like. And, and anywhere else, what's that called? Party. It's called a party. <laughs> but we don't, we don't party, that's not, that's not good. And let's face it, religious people, uh, like the Pharisees in Luke chapter 5, don't care for those kind of people, those disreputable people, those ungodly people. And they told Jesus that. Why are you hanging out with those people? Why are you hanging out with those kind of people? Um, sad thing is churches are dying across the United States of America because they, don't want to be a or because they want to be a church for the righteous, not the sinners. Let me say that correctly. Churches are dying all across our country because they want to be churches for the righteous, not the sinners. And, that, and I don't know about you, that grieves my heart. That's why last week I was in Alaska teaching churches about how to reach the unchurched. Uh, yeah, I went to Alaska in February because my timing is not the best. But, um, <laughs> but see, here at Calvary, we want sinners we want the sinners. We, look, we know sinners are messy. They have problems. They don't know the church rules. 
But you know what? The sinners are just like the rest of us. They're just like the rest of us because we're all sinners. I mean, that's reality. And, and by the way, that's why the religious people back then didn't like Jesus because Jesus partied with a holy purpose. I know some of you are like choked on the words Jesus partied. So I ask you, do you want to go to a party with Jesus? See, I mean, it's a whole different concept. I want you to think about this. Jesus partied with a holy purpose. He tells us that. Did, did you catch that at the, in verse 32? He says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, he was at a party when he said that. I haven't come to call the righteous. I've come to call sinners to repentance. Um, I love one translation I read in that. I have not come to call those who think they're righteous. <laughs> I have not come to call those who think they're righteous. I've come to call sinners to repentance. So Jesus hung out with people who knew they were sinners. He didn't hang out with the people who thought they weren't sinners. And, and if you grew up one of, as one of those religious people and you've still got a lot of that stuff inside of you, uh, I'm, I'm gonna make you a little bit more uncomfortable than maybe you already are. Because religious people think they're good people and I've had, them, I've had some of them, you know, argue with me and protest and say, well, God wants us to be good, doesn't he? We, we should try to be good. God wants us to be good. So here's two truths that I, I want to share with you when you think about, does God want us to be good? The first truth is no one is righteous, not even one. The Apostle Paul in, in uh, Romans chapter 3 spells it out, long paragraph. He explains it in detail. I'll just take the, the leading verse. Uh, no one is righteous. No one. Not you, not me, not the Pope, not uh, somebody who goes to church seven days a week. Doesn't matter. No one is righteous. So um, uh, I, I, I have trouble, re and I'm just gonna confess. I've been confessing a lot. I have trouble respecting people who, who say uh, people are basically good. You ever, you ever run into people that, well, I just believe people are basically good. And, and, um, and, and, I, and I don't respect that opinion for two reasons. Uh, well, three if you count the Bible. But um, the first one is because I'm evil and I know it. I'm evil and I know it. Look, uh, I, I've been following Jesus since I was eight years old. I've been serious about doing what he wants since I was 17 and I surrendered to ministry. Um, but I, I'm also evil. I know my own heart, and I know the deception. I know the wickedness. I know uh, all that's in there. I look, I fight against it. I try not to indulge what the, the evil inside wants to, to get out, but it's still there. And, and so I know me, and so I know uh, I'm not righteous. I, I don't think as badly about you as I do about myself, uh, but if you're half as bad as I am, you're still pretty disgusting. So... <laughs> So I don't really respect that whole people are basically good because I know me. And the other reason is I don't, I, I don't, when people say people are basically good, I, I just want to look at them and go, obviously you don't know any preschoolers. <laughs> right? Because if you honestly are sitting there and you believe people are basically good, you need to volunteer to work in our early childhood wing. And, and when I say work in the early childhood, I don't mean hold the babies. Because they're not old enough to express the rebellion that's in their hearts yet. You need to go work with like the one to three-year-olds. You work with the one to three-year-olds, you will discover quickly that people are not basically good because nobody teaches toddlers to lie. And but they do. Nobody teaches toddlers how to scream, mine! And but they do. Nobody ever teaches a toddler how to hit another child with a toy truck but they do, right? They're, they're just, we're all natural born sinners. They just are really good at showing it. No one is righteous. And if you think that you are, this is where we call you to repent. So that's the first truth. That's the reason why, you know, no, God doesn't want us to be good because no one is righteous. And secondly, the goal in our lives is not to be good the goal is to follow Jesus. Let me say that again. Because we, we, if we're pursuing the wrong goal, we're gonna end up at the wrong place. Our goal in life is not to be good people. Our goal is to follow Jesus. See, if you're focused on being good, a good religious person has a checklist of holiness, right? So I gotta attend church, check. 
I got to give money, check. I got to read the Bible, check. I got to pray, check. I got to abstain from a whole bunch of stuff, uh, check, 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 sort of check. Uh, okay, I'm a good person. I can feel good about myself. I'm holy. That is not the point. That is not the goal. The goal is to follow Jesus. And if you follow Jesus, and if you love Jesus, and if you worship Jesus, guess what? Jesus will change your life. And, and if Jesus changes your life for real, you're gonna begin to exhibit the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what the fruit of the Holy Spirit is? It's found in Galatians chapter five. It is the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Oh, guess what? Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, you don't even need the law. It doesn't matter. You see, if, if you follow Jesus, your life will be loving and joyful and good. See, growing up in church, I've known many good people who didn't love. That's not Jesus. But I've never met somebody who really loved Jesus and loves people who wasn't good. Now, now that we've established that, that God doesn't really want us to be good, I want you to see Jesus' purpose in the party. Okay, because he had a purpose. And when I wrote this the first time, I thought Jesus had a purpose in his party, uh, but and nobody else does. And I went, oh no, everybody has a purpose when they party. <laughs> right? I mean, there's always a purpose. I mean, my purpose might just be, I'm gonna have fun. It, it might be to get wasted. It might be to forget their hurts and numb their pain or just to get lucky. But everyone has a purpose. <laughs> what? It's true, right? I, do you guys not know the same people that I know? <laughs> but see, Jesus parties with a holy purpose, a holy purpose to call sinners, to call disreputable people to repentance. And to do that, guess what? You have to be around people who know they aren't perfect and influence them towards Jesus. So if you're in the kingdom of God and you know it, please join the celebration and party with a holy purpose. I mean, you probably have friends that you might think, oh, they would never come to church in a million years. If you have friends that you think would never come to church in a million years, please invite them to the party. I'm serious, I want you to invite them to the party. Give them a chance. Let God surprise you. I mean, after all, how many of you were the last person that you would expect to see in church on a Sunday? How many of you? Come on, put those hands up. Last, you were the last one. You were the guy that no, people would name if they said, no, they'll never be in church. Hold them up, hold them up high. Brag on it just for a second. Look around you. That's the reason that we celebrate life change here at Calvary. Because about one fourth of this congregation right here on this Saturday night in, in mid-February, Super Bowl weekend, said nobody thought we would ever experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, and yet here you are. You are evidence of God's miraculous grace and power to change anyone. And yeah. So if, uh, if God can change you, let's invite the people that nobody else thinks he can change, because we know differently. Because the kingdom of God is a party for disreputable people like you and like me. But the neat thing about the kingdom of God as a party is there's room for more. So uh, let's celebrate and let's initiate the life-changing goodness of Jesus Christ and rejoice in what he's done in your life. Let it show on your face, let it show in your lives, let it show in your words. And let's bring, uh, let's bring our disreputable friends to the party where they can meet the Savior. Let's pray. God, we love you. It is amazing that you love us. It is amazing that you were willing to sacrifice everything to redeem us, that you sent your one and only son into this world to suffer and die on the cross for our sins so that he could defeat sin and death and hell and, and we see that in his resurrection. God, make that, that story of Jesus' death and resurrection central in our mind, in our hearts, so that we can live with that ever-present joy of the victory that you have given us through our Savior, Jesus. 
And Lord, let us be mindful of the people around us who are hopeless, who are hurting, who are broken, who are desperate, and who need to taste what it feels like to be forgiven. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.